So you're in for an hour plus of my lousy voice and this guy's ugly looks over here. So <laughs> let's let's get going. First safety all the time. So what we're gonna do is Peter, do you want glasses? Yes, please. Can I? Yep. Thank you. I'll just use the color glasses. I can still see with yellow. Okay. There'll be a flashback from 69, but that's okay. Work okay. Working? Let's uh, explain this, Peter, why we have this problem with hooking it up. Well, this is an AC sealant detector, and an AC sealant detector is going to be used to detect if someone has put sealant in the car that really shouldn't be there. And we know that a lot of the Joe Backyard mechanics out there have sealant in those small cans. They all try to fix it themselves. And the sealant, unfortunately, if it doesn't fix the leak, it'll float around in the system potentially solidifying, and of course, because it didn't fix the leak G, that's why they're coming to you to have the AC service. Exactly, and then it's gonna fix something. It's gonna fix your machine. It could fix your machine. It could fix other parts of the car that shouldn't be fixed. Yeah, now let me talk about fixing the machine, a real, a real story here. Now you can see here, Craig is zoned in. We see the ball floating. We can put this little band here so we know where it starts from. If there is a leak, Peter, tell them what happens with this ball. If we have sealant in it. If we have sealant, what happens is the refrigerant and the oil are going to come out of the high side port that we're connected to. It's going to go through a small cartridge that's really just a big flow restrictor. And that cartridge is going to get clogged up with the sealant. When I clog this, the cartridge up with sealant, this ball is going to fall. And when this ball falls, oh, 40% or so in less than three minutes, that means something has clogged up that restrictor. And that means you've got sealant. That's right. So Craig, if you could get in on this, this is what Peter's talking about. We wet it. There's a little syringe. We wet it and shake it out a little bit. This is what we have connected again to the high side. Now, this is really good insurance. And what I mean by insurance, the story I'm about to tell you is absolutely true. I had a very expensive air conditioning machine. And I had um, a person I was renting a shop to. And he didn't use this. He hooked up the air conditioning machine, and guess what happened? The sealant went in there and ruined the machine, sealed up the solenoid jumper. Now he couldn't help his customers. He ruined my machine. All he needed to do was buy this unit. And this is not that expensive. No. Okay. And as far as I know, and this is not a plug for Neutronics, but I believe they're the only people out there with it. Uh, at the end of this, you can find out more where you can purchase this from. It really is something that you should check. You know, you don't get into your car without putting the seatbelt on for safety or having airbags for safety. You protect yourself when you're doing other things. Protection is important. If you don't protect yourself here from this system that may have sealant in there, guess what? You're out of business. You're out of business. Shut down. Now, do I want to ruin my three to 5000 or more expensive air conditioning machine? Or what we're going to show you next, the actual identifier. We're going to make a couple more minutes go by, but we're fine. We did check this before. Okay. We're going to hook this up. This is an identifier for refrigerant. Now, a lot of you tell me, I do a lot of classes, and a lot of you say, oh, you want me to hold that up there, Craig? Okay. A lot of these people say, well, we don't need, we don't need to identify it anymore. This is Vanner over here. Get that out of my ugly face, will you? We don't need that identifier. Wow, now it's all back. We're 69, we're going back on. <laughs> now again. Uh, we don't need that identifier. I'm going to tell you one reason why and let Peter elaborate on this more. I've come across not only the 134 container, container 134A, a lot of air, okay? Right. And 12 or 22 in it. Yep. Now you may go, why, Peter? Why are they going to have 12 or 22 in this container? Uh, well, one of the reasons they're going to have 12 or 22 is because a lot of this stuff comes from overseas. We won't tell you where overseas. Uh, well, you guys know where, but by yeah. America. That's right. That's right. Somewhere for overseas. People who own half of America at this point. Uh, and uh, that stuff's real cheap. The 12, the 22, those things are very inexpensive. They're trying to get rid of it, right? Sure. No market for it anymore. That's right. So That's you right. remember the days of 12 being quite expensive. Yep. So what Peter's really saying, it's not unlikely that someone will get a container 
and put 12 or 22 or some other old, old chlorine-based refrigerant in the R134 container that you're buying. Yep. Tell them some of the other tricks they do for weight in the container. Well, and there's one thing, there's not a whole lot you can do about it, but how about sand? If I put sand in that container, I can still pull a vacuum on it, put refrigerant in it, and seven pounds of sand weighs seven pounds just like refrigerant does. You can use water. And if you use water, you end up with a little bit of non-condensables. Identifier can tell you that if you've got non-condensables. And one of the big things, just like sealant does, the wrong refrigerant, like a 415B or something like right. that, can ruin your AC service machine. Not only ruin what's in the car, but can ruin the AC service machine and recycle, recovery recycling machine by taking out the solenoids, taking out the seats and seals and rubber that's inside. And when your AC service machine company comes to service your machine that you think is under warranty. It's no longer, is it? <laughs> One of the first things they're going to do is they're going to check what refrigerant you've been running for. That's right. And if you're running the wrong refrigerant, guess who's paying? That's right. Now, one of the other things, 22 has been around a long time. And yeah. what does 22 do to seals? Oh, it's going to swell the seals. As a matter of fact, a lot of the products that are sold over the, the counter have seal swellers in them. Not only sealants for metal, but seal swellers. And that's basically an R22 type material that's going to swell those seals. And if it swells seals that are leaking, maybe that's okay. If it swells seals that are not leaking, well, they're going <laughs> to leak. They're going to leak. They're going to leak. Yeah. So we're going to check it just to make sure. And this is a nifty machine that has a print out the whole thing. This goes on the low side. So I'm going to put my glasses on just to see. No sealant. Pop that guy off. We're popping this off. Get this out of the way. We're going to hook this up. Hey, I wanted, while, while you grab that there, I wanted to, uh, we get a lot of questions about fines. So I got sealant. What do I do if I find sealant in the car? Well, the best advice we can give, and this kind of goes for our friends that intercepted yep. and the recovery machine guys and, and the flushing guys and so forth, is find it, filter it, flush it. This way, that way. I'm bad as not a white. I've been let banner over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll we'll just put it in front of my face and it'll work for you. Um, but if you find there, find out if there's sealant in there. If there is sealant, make sure you have something like a recycle guard from Airsep in line between the vehicle and the AC service or the recovery recycling machine to filter out any of that sealant that keeps it from getting in the car. Very important. Then you have to do a flush. Why? Because 90% of that sealant is left behind. We all know when we do a recovery of the refrigerant, we only get a little bit of oil out of it. Just anymore, just a little bit of oil. Well, the sealant's going to travel with that oil. So if you got 10% of the oil out, that means you got 10% of the sealant. Where's the rest of it? In the car. In the what car. What happens when I crack open that system to replace that condenser? I just let moisture and air into that car. And what's moisture and air going to be? You're going to have a big epoxy thing in there. Right? That's exactly right. And now I've got more problems than I know what to do with. So find it, filter it, flush it. So if you're going to service a car with sealant in it, make sure the filters are installed, make sure you do a flush, and of course you get to charge the customer for it. Too. Right. By the way, this is very reasonably priced. You know, you can get the air set stuff from quite a few different places. It's something that you should have for protection. Now what Peter's going to do is going to hook this up to the car, and now he's on that low side. Yep. He has a reading coming up. If you could hold that up there, Vanna, while I put this down. When you test test the refrigerant in a car, you have a couple of a couple of different choices. With this particular model and several other models, some from uh, Robin Air and others, you keep it still. Get that in my <laughs> oh, sorry, right here. There you go. Good. You have a couple of choices. You can do 12, you can do 134A, some will do 22 and so forth. But this particular model, you can pick 12 or 134A because in reality, the refrigerant analyzer doesn't know what kind of car came into the shop. It's counting on you to tell it. So in this case, if you pick 134A, and as we see, this is 100% 134A, it'll only give you a green light and a pass if it really is 134A. And what would happen if we had air in the system? Well, in this particular case, we would see the air here as a percentage. And gee, you know the effect on air? Air, 1% air, 1 degree of lost cooling performance at the center back. And it actually ruins your accumulator, causes hydrofluoric acid, starts eating away at stuff, and we have problems. 
why don't we print it so you can give this to the customer? And here's the great thing. Again, I always tell my students the best thing to do, and students, I mean technicians like yourself, is buy something that prints. Very, very important because if I can give this to my customer and say, look, your system did not have 100%. Here's what we need to do. Now, when it comes to the sealant thing, you're just going to have to show them our little sealant thing here. It doesn't, it doesn't print. But we can show them, hey, we started up here, and it went all the way down to the bottom. And then we need to use our special tool here, our air set filter, and right. it's going to cost the money. We need to do other things to the system. That's right. So it's pretty That's simple. Right. Okay. So now, we'll talk about a couple of other things as I am putting this on. Before we start the, um, our air condition service, I always like looking at my machine, and if I placed it back in the correct position, what I mean by position, is my gauges should be in a vacuum. And what I did here, you can see they're down, and also this does a vacuum leak test, okay? And it tells me it passed. Now, why is that important? Well, my hoses could be loose on my air conditioning machine, right? Yeah. I could have a leak somewhere internal of the machine. You could have a bad O-ring in one of the yeah. Exactly. So I always like checking to say, hey, the integrity of my hoses and my machine is good. I'm not going to blame my machine. Yep. So the next step is now I'm going to put this on here. I put the coupler on. I'm turning it down, low side, high side. Sometimes it's easier said than done. This high side is a little bit of a bear sometimes, but bear with me. You need help with that, do you? Okay, now one of the things I always like doing, and I want Craig to zone in here, is it's about 80 degrees in here and about one Fahrenheit equals one pound. So notice we have about 79 or so here and we have the same there. This tells me what, Peter? Well, it tells me that you've got equal pressures high and low side and that uh, we actually can start the test and that we don't have a problem with something that's locked up. That's so it's not high locked up. Is so high? Or the low side to safety. So not blacked up or backed up like yep. you. Okay. Hey, hey. <laughs> By the way, in case you missed it, G did stop his subscription to Hair Club for Men. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so he's a little backed up, but our system is not meaning we have equal pressures. We want to make this, we know this is an August night and you're, you know, got better things to do. We want to give you good information, keep you amused somewhat. G just as a, an aside, so you know you, you know what these are? This is the primary seal for the AC the service ports. Not that trader valve, the caps are considered the primary seal. So just as an aside, you're servicing an AC system and it comes without, in without caps, make sure you put caps on it. Right. They are the primary seal. And sometimes a little bit of oil on the cap, and when we talk about oil, don't use a peg oil, use yep. a POE. Yep. Lubricate it lightly, and if you see dirt down in those ports, you know, carefully, low, low pressure, kind of blow it out because you don't want anything going in there. Right. Very important. In fact, I always keep around extra caps to make sure I don't have that problem. Right. Very good. So now we're going to do this, and of course the machine's going to make noise as we're doing this. We have good pressures there. We're going to hit automatic. We're going to recover the refrigerant, which means we're going to take the refrigerant out. Yep. We're going to evacuate it. Well, we can yak for a long time. We'll be here for a while. Yep. We're going to put a minimal of 45 minutes on this one. Okay, even though it is J standard, on this machine you can do it in a shorter period of time. Why don't you explain about, that? About, about 30 minutes. The, the SAEJ2788 standard that this machine and others are built to, but that's what's allowed to be sold here in the U.S. right now, um, requires that this machine be able to evacuate the system to 95% of the refrigerant. So pull 95% of the refrigerant out in 30 minutes or less. It's going to do a couple things for you. One, it's got to reduce your vacuum time because once I pulled 95% of the refrigerant out, there's only 5% left, and therefore that 5% has already started boiling out of the oil and allow a lower vacuum time. Second thing is, if for some reason, I don't know why, you're not doing a vacuum on the system, if you only pulled 80% of the refrigerant out 
and you have a system with say 20 ounces of refrigerant, and I only get 80% out, that means I've only pulled 16 ounces out. But if I think I've pulled it all out, because I don't know it only got 80% out, and I charge 20 ounces on top of it, I got to overcharge 24 ounces in a 134A system. It's not going to be a happy system, Chief. No. no. And that's going to be a problem. We're going to talk about scales once we start getting this going. We'll talk about this weight and scales here. So bear with us. Let us recover, okay, and get this thing going. So I'm going to get automatic. Yeah, I mean, okay. good Frank Sinatra music you can play in the <laughs> background track. No? No? Well, can we talk about the Phillies? Yeah? No, no. There's, no. Not, there's none of that going on. No? No? How about the Red Sox? That makes you happy. <laughs> Steven, I think you ought to start the car. We may be leaving. <laughs> leak test. I will warn you with the leak test. You remember what uh, Peter just said? This system is pretty smart, and it sees if there's a pressure change, and pressure change could be from refrigerant stuck in the oil, right? Sure. So as we go through, maybe it'll fail the leak test, which is pretty neat. That means some of the refrigerant got stuck in the oil. It sees the difference. It's going to let you go back on or recover it somewhat. Yeah. So we're going to say yes, and charge, we're going to say yes. The, data, the database is pretty neat. We can go here with the database and plug into it. This is in. We're going to go down to the year of this vehicle. It's 2004. It's going to start with 1990. For some reason, it goes all the way back to 1990. That tells me that some vehicle in 1990 used 134A, because why would I want to go back that far if it's 134A machine? By the way, when, if you're doing recovery with one of these, this is really for vehicles that were factory equipped with 134A. The database really doesn't account for a 1992 car that was originally R12 that might have been retrofitted. So you may not find that vehicle from 1992 with a retrofit in this database. This is for OE original we'll need to consult. That's so I'm picking the liberty here and to make things just go quicker here, we're going to access the database. It's a V6. Only you would use the V6. And it kind of tells us the capacity of oil in the condenser, the accumulator, the 1.37 pounds, all that good stuff. And then we can just continue on. So we're going to go here to 0137, I believe, right? That's what it said. And that's what we also have there. Yep. Now, another thing while we're doing this, Another thing why we're doing this is what's pretty much um, important to need to recover all this stuff here. Some machines you're working on, a lot of you guys have older machines. Every 96 inch hose, meaning these air conditioned hoses, you need to add two ounces more of refrigerant per hose. Not on this piece of equipment. Right. This compensates itself. So, I know there's a lot of pieces of equipment out there, Peter, yep. that have three hoses. Why three hoses? We have a low side, a high side, and the middle hose for the gauge set that connects out of the machine. Yep. That means you could put anywhere from four ounces to six ounces of refrigerant on top of the two pounds, six ounces per second. Yep. 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 So account for those hoses if the machine doesn't do it by itself. That's right. Now, let's talk about another problem. The other problem is, this is a nice little weight here. We'll take it out of this little baggie. This little weight, basically, for this 2788 machine, it actually makes the scale or calibrates the scale. Okay? Now, when was the last time you calibrated your scale? Now, you pull these things in and out in the repair shop, yep. gas stations, they got lips, they got cracks in Dropping the floor. cylinders on them. Uh, yep. Banging them on there, and you're at that 50 pounder, that 30 pounder, whatever. You bang it down on the machine. The scale gets out of whack after a while, doesn't it? So, you need to calibrate. This one comes with calibration. Now, the other thing as we're going through here that we should talk about is I'm going to do I'm going to speak about something else, and that's hybrid vehicles, because we do want to give you that information. Yep, about a half a pound, by the way, half a pound gone. So we're uh, moving right along. Beautiful. Pulling it down. Now, this is a 
Craig will need you when you get a chance to zoom in. This is another Aircept product. And if you're working on hybrid vehicles, it's very, very important to have this. Yeah. You know, there's such thing as flushing the hoses on a machine, but let's face it, you're dealing with some compressors that have 100 plus volts usually of electricity going through them. You don't want to put a tag oil in because yeah. the tag oil properties yeah. are an line that could eat the, uh, yes. the insulation yeah. up yeah. on the windings. Yeah. We don't need that one. No. So, Peter, tell us what this does and why we should use it. Well, the air set, the charge guard, what it's going to do is it's, it's going to look up and niche. Okay. It must be you. I'm allergic to you. Get away from me. Yeah, it's too close. Too close. <laughs> okay. uh, the charge guard is going to go between the vehicle and the AC service machine so that when you recharge the vehicle, any tag oil or anything that was left in the hoses of the service machine get trapped in here and don't let those bad oils, they're not bad oils, it's bad for hybrid, but those bad oils contaminate the uh, AC system of a hybrid vehicle, especially those hybrids that use those electric compressors that could run several hundred volts through there and essentially make the entire engine compartment Taste the compressor and anything that's attached to it. Make it hot. It'll that's be a right. shocking experience. It would be. Of course, we all know that if we're working on hybrids, there's a special set of gloves we need to be wearing all the time. But this is a device because here's what they say. If you have not yet run the compressor in like a Honda vehicle, right. then you only need to pull the compressor out. But that only works if all you did was put oil in the compressor. Correct. If you run it, the entire system, system must be replaced. Not flushed, replaced. That's an expensive proposition. Very expensive. And this will keep you from having that situation occur intentionally, accidentally, or unknowingly. Wouldn't you hate it, Gene? If hey, the that. customer, if the customer, the guy who owns the car, lifted the hood of the car at some point, put his hand in the wrong place and it was electrically hot because you charged some tag oil and it should have been. And that may come back to you. So that's something on hybrids, which brings us to another good product from our friends at UView. Now, this here is a J2297 approved OE die for hybrid vehicles, okay? And this is the type of stuff that we use. This is a special Peg, uh, non peg oil, a POE, polyester type oil, just for hybrids. Now, with that said, this is the stuff to get. You're probably wondering in the background, you heard some shh, shh, you hear some clicking. One of the other problems I see, Peter, on a lot of machines that you guys own out there, you may not have the latest and the greatest nice machine like this. What do they have? Manual purging machines. Sure. When was the last time they checked to purge the air out themselves out of that machine? Yep. Do you realize there's a temperature compensating device on there? Yep. You need to open the valve up. Yep. Okay. Now, if you have an auto purging, you'll hear it go shh, shh right. and click out. Yep. So that's something. Now, Craig, are there questions? Because we went quite, quite far. No. Okay. So. We are going to continue on with, as this is going through, we're going to have Peter speak about the 1234. 1234, where we're at. But one more thing while we do that so we can get a lot of things done with vehicles is we're going to go one other step because we're going to utilize this mist machine. And this is really good. You know, you have, we said before, some odors in a vehicle. Uh, some problems with uh, mold in there. This system plugs right in the cigarette lighter of the car. We take this bottle, we screw it in. I already put one in here to show you. We crush the bottle, puts all of this cleaning solution in the machine, okay? We put this on the passenger floor. There's actually a little level button to tell us to keep it level. Plug it in, hit the button. Bingo, with the fan on this thing, Oh, good. So I'm going to set it up for later when we're running the car. Right. We put the fan on, and we'll be doing that later. So I'll set that up in the vehicle. Take care of odors and bacteria and all kinds. Well, of you're noted. We'll take care of you. How come you're still here? Well, you know that's because we had dinner together in the tacos room. Much. 
Well, you're going to take over Taco Master. Uh, and uh, here you go. Craig, Craig, you got that video, or you got the, uh, the PowerPoint there. They don't need to see me. They need to see that one. Right there. All right, Craig's got that up and running. We'll see if I can figure out how to operate this. One of these buttons is one and one's the other, right? No, you just have to tell me to turn the slide. Okay, good. We're going to tell Craig to push the button. Um, 1234 YF is coming. First question we always get, you know, I, I go to the SAE meetings and the Mac stuff and I get to talk to a lot of different people and uh, people in the industry and, and of course lots of technicians. Uh, 1234 YF is definitely coming. There is no question about it. It will be the replacement for 134A. And in a moment, we'll be able to tell you the who, what, where, when, why, and how of where we're at. Can you uh, pop that for us? Well, you have the popper again. You have the popper. Well, he said he's got to do a manual. Got to do a uh, okay. battery issue potential. Okay. You never forget your battery. You always have battery. Yeah. First of all, the question is who? Everyone, eventually. Everyone, all the OEMs will eventually change to 1234 wire. Some will be sooner than others, such as Daimler Benz in November 2011 in Europe. Um, GM in the spring, early summer of 2012 here in the U.S. Um, here are things like Mazda or Nissan may not be the 2014 model year cars. So Peter, let me stop you a second. So this basically means if I'm in the body shop business or I do a lot of new cars, you know, sometimes there's a lot of Hertz rentals and so on, yep. that your customer base wants to pick it up, I'm going to need to get a machine within about a year or so. That, yeah, that's right. Don't assume that just because these vehicles are still under warranty that the dealer is going to be servicing them because there's a lot of aftermarket service, and particularly the body shop. We know G. First thing that happens to a brand new car as soon as it rolls off the truck and into a dealership, somebody goes out and wrecks one. And that dealership may not be equipped to repair it. They contract out to a body shop. The body that's shop needs to be able to do it. And this is new equipment that they need. So basically, guys, you know, just like when 134 came around years ago, some of you just didn't do your homework ahead of time. Then you made this uh, impulse type of decision to buy this piece of equipment from the blue guys, the red guys, the purple guys. They came in and sold it, and then you realized there was something better out there. Yeah. Do your homework. Stay informed, and this is why we had Peter come out. Again, Neutronics has been great with us coming out for years, giving us the updates. So continue on, Peter. Well, what are we going to do? We, we, we know the who. It's going to be everybody. We know what. It's going to be 1234YF. Where? Well, we're going to start in Europe. We're going to move to the U.S. Then we're going to jump to Asia. And eventually, we're going to get to places like Brazil and Argentina and South America and Antarctica, I guess. Yeah. They do cars. I don't know. They need air conditioning in Antarctica. I don't know. But, but we'll get everywhere. Um, Europe, particularly Daimler, in 2011, November roughly time frame. Uh, U.S. General Motors in the spring of 2012, around April, maybe like a Buick Lacrosse, maybe possibly. Uh, maybe maybe they they all the same. You never know. You, you never know. Um, and uh, then back in in May of 2012, we expect Volkswagen Audi in Europe to introduce it. What we don't know is. How soon Daimler is going to send it to the U.S. and how soon Volkswagen Audi is going to send it to the U.S. Especially since they're building it and Volkswagen just built a brand new factory. Right. And that's and really they're exporting. Big yep. And so yep. That's, that's a big deal. It's a global marketplace. Well, they build the Volkswagens no in Mexico. They export them everywhere. And they don't want to get into a situation where they put 134A in cars that go to the countries that only uh, they don't need 1234 and the expensive stuff. And this is, <laughs> this is why, again, because it's <laughs> expensive. And this is why General Motors didn't make that decision yet. Right. Once they have the factory, you know, the Chevy Bolt is built for the Cadillac and the uh, Buick. Once they make that decision, that plant is going to be very, very tough to go from one refrigerant to another refrigerant between parts. You're sure. better off just using it. Yeah, you got to go. It's a whole filling plant. So we're, actually, one of the car makers, one of the Europeans, actually considered filling the refrigerant at the port of import where the car was going. Wow. So they would send it potentially from Europe to the U.S. When it got to the U.S., 
they would make the appropriate adjustments and say put 134A. But if it was going to Europe, they'd put 1234. In the end, it wasn't an economical uh, decision for them to do that, so they chose not to. Why are we doing this? That's, a, that's another great question. Why are we going to do this? We're going to do that because... I think you want me to spend more money. That's what it is. No. Wow. Well, yeah, I hope you do. Well, why? Why do you? Well, it, it, well yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, <laughs> you need the right equipment, but here's the reason. Tell them. Tell them why it's important. Well, in Europe, the government in Europe decided that 134A, with its global warming potential of 1,403, at least that's what they calculated today, for, um, is uh, not suitable for the environment. So they said that we need to have a refrigerant with a global warming potential of less than 150, and you needed to do that for any new platform vehicle effective January 1st, 2011. Now, January 1st, 2011 was a little bit of a misnomer because they all went and got new platforms approved in December of 2010. Take some so time. they could make them, but now we're seeing like Daimler and then Volkswagen Audi having these vehicles come out soon. So that's why we needed this new refrigerant. It was really for Europe. It's a global marketplace. Let's have everybody use the same refrigerant so that we don't have a situation of trying to put different refrigerants in different cars from different countries. And that it makes it all make sense. Yep. yep. Now, you know, we always hate change in our industry, but look, we can't change what's going to happen. That's right. We're not lawmakers. This is what is going to be put in front of us in these vehicles. We just need to be up to date and know what to do with it. Yep. Let's talk about some of the, uh, the status here with this 1234 YF. What we're finding right now, supplies are very tight. It's very hard to get this, even for the OEM car makers. We know that some of them have actually delayed or cut back a little bit of production because they can't get enough refrigerant. But that's going to be rectified very shortly as a new plant overseas is uh, comes online, comes up and running. I want to show you something. I'm going to duck out for just a moment. You're going to duck me again. I was going to duck for you, but yeah. I'm ducking out. Uh, we want to show you what, uh, oh, let's see, Steve wants it. Five kilograms in here, right, Steve? -O? So it's about 11 pounds, and at $100 a pound, this is about $1,100. He's not leaving here. I'm loving Retail <laughs> of 1234 YF. This is the real deal. This is 1234 YF. This is about the size uh, cylinder you're going to get. It's not the style cylinder that you'll get. This is a special engineering cylinder. But about the size, we expect them to be about 5 kilogram or 11 pound cylinders at about $100 a pound. So this is pretty expensive. Let's, let's talk about this, Peter. You know, when R12 went up, when 134 was first introduced, and 12 was going into short supply, you may remember, well, I've had customers that went down and in New York City, parked the vehicle, came out, and the refrigerant was gone. Right. Which started me putting some lock, uh, not lock tech, some heat shrink over, and then it came right. out. I love the things they came out with, the yellow ones with the yep. serial number. Yep. But I would get customers come back, their system got emptied a couple of times because someone in the parking garage had access to their car or could pop the hood. They were running around and stealing it. Yep. Now, at $100 a pound, Boy, we're going to have some problems. Yep. Yep. One of the things that we, we think might happen is the possibility exists that your new car doesn't have any AC problems, but maybe it needs a brake job. Maybe you're a little rough on the brakes when you drive around the Bronx or something, or a little tough on the brakes. 23,000 miles, I need to put brakes on the car, right? A little squeal. I take it in for a brake job. Maybe I don't take it to the dealer. I just take it in for a brake job. Who knows? When they're doing that brake job, I might get a free refrigerant service because they may remove the 1234YF and drop in, say, 134A. So something else goes in. Something else. Now, in our industry, most of the aftermarket is very, very honest. Unfortunately, there are some people out there, whether it be the aftermarket or dealerships. Sure, do this. sure. Okay. So it's not it's not a difference that just the aftermarket can do this. Right. A dealership can do this. Right. Now, if they take this out, you know, you as the owner of the vehicle, you have an open a new vehicle to say it, you're not going to be too happy when you have issues later on. That's right. When someone goes to identify. Right. And right. let's say, could any machine take this out, Peter? Uh, well, in reality, if I'm using an approved machine, like a 2843 machine, 
then that machine is going to need to test the refrigerant first and identify if it's the correct stuff or not, and would actually shut down. If I'm using essentially a vacuum pump in a box, then yes, I could connect it like we do today. But a vacuum pump in a box is not an EPA allowed way of recovering the refrigerant and doesn't allow you to purify the refrigerant. So you're pulling $100 a pound worth of refrigerant out of a car, potentially, right. into a cylinder and you can't reuse that. So it really doesn't make economical sense to do it. Well, let's also ask this question. Does it have a different fitting than 134A? It does have a different fitting. It's similar. Similar. It's a different fitting. And but you can bet that someone will make the adapters out there to be able to do all yeah. kinds of funky little things. Now, it would be great if we said that new equipment is going to have a special identifier so to make sure to get the right product in the machine. It'd be good if they did not sell or register these connector ends so no one out there can just buy this and use a tank and start robbing your refrigerator. Right. This is stuff maybe through some group or whatever that we could actually do. It's going into recovery and clean, cleaning. It's still it's doing its thing. We're down to zero on engages uh, on our recovery. But it'd be good if we had a group that could kind of help us say, look, we could try to get some legislation through where this stuff cannot be made or it's some sort of just like, you know, locksmiths do or whatever, where it goes to a professional that they know where these ends went. Right. And that would be a lot better for us, especially whether you're a dealer or most of us are aftermarkets or body shop. So. Right, right. The unfortunate part of, of, of this new refrigerant is that um, it's pretty similar to 134F. So someone potentially could replace this with 134A, and because of that, and because you know we're an open market society here in the U.S., it's pretty likely that someone will find a way to be able to put uh, a different refrigerant into a car. And of course, that's why they've mandated refrigerant analyzers and some other tools to be able to recover the refrigerant. Here's the pressure temperature, temperature curves. We just, I just wanted to touch something else on that sure. slide, if you don't mind. Um, you know, you look here, you go down that estimated cost, 100 blood, a plus a pound. The German Firefighters Association has given this in the, a, an approval. Yep. But when we look at this refrigerant, a question always asked, is it flammable? Yes, it is flammable, but it's slightly flammable. Right. But let me ask you another question. Sure. Was R12 and R134A flammable? Under certain conditions, they certainly were. And R134A with about eight pounds of pressure could be a boom. Yep. Right? Yep. So this used properly is not a problem. The right equipment, right. the whole thing. Right. This is what I, a point I wanted to make. Right. So they, one of the changes that they made when they went to this refrigerant is they really left the entire AC system intact exactly the way we've been doing it before. Minor che to, uh, tweaks to the TXV or condenser or other things. But it has an evaporator that's a stronger evaporator. Because they wanted to make sure if anybody ever worked on a Chrysler minivan, we know they're kind of famous for that sometimes. Um, they wanted to make sure the evaporators minimized any leakage. And healthy me didn't go and start leaking. Uh, that's over. right. That's right. <laughs> Only because once you're in the passenger compartment and the windows are up, you're now in kind of an enclosed space. And although the chances of anything happening is, is just infinitesimally low, right. they were taking that extra precaution. Why? Because we live in the land of litigation and uh, someone was afraid that there was, a, there was a lawyer out there ready to pounce on this. Now, I have another question here. Sure. You know, we were talking about scales and making sure they're, they're correct. Basically, you want to, at $100 a pound, you really want to make sure you put in the correct charge, right? Absolutely. If you overcharge this, not only are you wasting your own money, yep. but if you extremely overcharge it and it goes off at a high pressure valve, yep. you're not blowing out $3 a pound, you're blowing out $100 a pound. Right. So very, very important to make sure that you have good equipment and you test this equipment. Yep. You know, yep. let's also talk about the testing of equipment, what we also need to do on vacuum pumps, like this thing here sure. has seven minutes remaining for the leak down of the vacuum here. Yep. What do you need to do with your vacuum pump that most shops never ever do? Well, one of the first things you need to make sure of is if you have a uh, compressor problem, burned up compressor. Oh, that's what not common nowadays. No, never. No. <laughs> now, 
when you burn up the compressor, you don't only burn up the compressor, you burn up the oil in the compressor. Okay. So now I'm going to recover that refrigerant. I can clean that oil up, but when I pull the vacuum on it, I want to make sure that I change the vacuum pump oil after I recover or vacuum a system from a burned up compressor. Of course, I got to crack that system open, I got to put a new compressor in and so forth. But anytime I have a burnout. Second thing is, when you're working, say, 30 to 50 cars on average. So depending on where you live, how many cars you do. Arizona, so, Florida, yep. you know, you're doing a lot, but we had a hot summer here, you yep. need to change that oil. Right. Recommendation this, is 30 to 50 vehicles. So that's important. 30 to 50 vehicles, change your vacuum pump oil with special vacuum pump oil, by the way. Right. And the filters on a machine that some people never do either. Sure, sure. Now the newer yeah. machines, the 2788 machines, require that they I'm automatically kind of lock you out at a certain point, maybe, uh, I'm not sure exact number, maybe 150 pounds of refrigerant, yeah, something like that. When it goes through process. It. And but then you have to do you it. You have <laughs> to change it. Right, have to change the filters. If you're working with an older machine, you need to make sure you change those filters too, because if you're not changing those filters, then you can allow some acid, yeah. some moisture through into your uh, recovered, recycled refrigerant, yeah. which might accidentally get charged back into a vehicle and potentially could cause some earlier degradation of the components. No doubt. Very good information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what we were talking about, 134A and 1234Y have almost identical pressures. Well, they Virtually look high and low for this, identical. isn't it? Yep. They look high and low to try to keep it in that same pressure range. Yep. So we could use a similar system that techs are familiar with without too many changes. So very similar, very similar performance. The efficiency of 134A is ever so slightly better in a standard system than 1234YF was. However, the improvements that they're making in uh, some of the TXV technologies and some other component, different, minor component tweaking. The different condenses. Maybe. Right. Yes. And all that, all that kind of stuff that is going to get us, get us so that we're really on par. In the old days, when you put 134A in an R12 car as a retrofit, everybody said, this stuff doesn't work. Or when you bought a 134A car in 1994, First thing people said was the air conditioning is not nearly as cold as it was in my 1987 because of this <laughs> new refrigerant. And that's because we were trying to take 134A and put it into an R12 system. And it wasn't made for it. And it wasn't made different for Different compressors in some cases. Sure. Different condensers, yeah. different evaporators. And speaking of that, you know, there's a lot of cheap parts out there. And here's an issue nowadays, you know, if you have a particular vehicle, and we'll talk 134A here, never mind the 1234YF, we put a different condenser on. The condenser from Joe Schmoland that's cheaper is not going to be a bargain because it may not have the same capacity, or hold I should say, the same capacity as the OE1 or a good name brand type on wood. That's right. Be careful, there's a lot of that junk out there. Right. It may so, not meet the SAE requirements, right. especially when we look at the new SAE standards like 2911 is a standard that says if you're going to make something to an SAE spec, or 1234, you have to actually register that product with the test results from a registered laboratory with SAE. So you can't just slap an SAE label on any old part and say, hey, we tested it, we're approved. Can't do that anymore. And you know, again, you come across enough of these things where people put the wrong parts in, they think they're getting a bargain and not. So be careful right. about that. Right. Let's continue on with some of these. On, on 1234YF, we have three basic pieces of equipment. There's a whole bunch of standards, but there's three basic ones. First of all, we've got a 2843, an SAE J2843 recovery recycling machine. That'll be required. That is very similar to your 2788, your SAE J2788 machine that we're using now. Same type of um, requirement for 95% in 30 minutes or less, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but it's designed for 1234. J2913 leak detectors, again, very similar standard to the 2791 leak detector standard that we'll talk about in a moment for 134A. And then 2912 or J2912 refrigerant identifiers, just like the one we showed you earlier that was for 12 and 134A, or 2927, which uh, would look something like this. Excuse me. Craig, if you can kind of Craig, get in on that. Can you show us that? This would be. Where we go? There we go. This would be what would be considered a 2927 unit. It's a module 
that goes uh, inside the system, the, uh, the AC service machine, and automatically would test the refrigerant as it was going through the machine. And tell them some of the security things that they do that. What are you showing? There's a USB connector? Well, yeah, they, everything now um, is going to be done through a USB connection. We've got a power port. We've also got a serial port for some other reasons. But um, it's all AES-256 encryption. Why, why is that? Well, that wasn't our idea. That was the idea of the standards people because they said, we want to make sure that nobody can take one of those USB stick drive things and buy one off the internet that automatically bypasses the refrigerant analyzer test on, on an AC service machine. They wanted to make sure that the, that connection was secure, that it had to have a real um, good pass signal before from it a, continues. a valid refrigerant analyzer before it was allowed to continue. So we don't want to get air conditioned aids per se. Yeah, per se, right. right. Or, so. or or really, the other thing we need to consider is, you know what? how expensive that refrigerant is? Remember I showed you this? Yeah. Okay, well, right? What's that? $1,100 for 11 pounds? He's not going home again. Yeah, right. $1,100. Yeah. Kick it through a tunnel. Yeah, that's amazing. $1,100 for 11 pounds of refrigerant. So when I have that kind of value, the last thing I want to do is accidentally pull some R22 in there because Joe Backyard Mechanic has a buddy who used to do HVAC 20 years ago and had some leftover refrigerant that he said he's going to top it off. No doubt. Because what happens? That refrigerant's trash. That's a lot of expense if I trash that refrigerant. No doubt. So we're also going to have uh, a new PAG-based oil. Um, so an update on what we have now. Yeah, not quite sure what's so different about it, but there is a new oil standard coming. Um, it does improve flow with the new refrigerant because the new refrigerant with the older oil had some lubrication issues. Oh, yeah. you couldn't carry that oil very well. So we're going to get a new oil for 1234YF. And I assume for hybrids with this 1234YF, yeah. there's going to be a different non-pad based oil. Yeah, actually, I, 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 gee, I'm not sure if it's going to be different or not. But what we know is that it's going to be a 1234YF oil, and it's going to be non-PAG based. Whether someone comes up with a universal oil for 134A, 1234YF to be used on hybrids, I'm not sure about. I know we don't expect to see that on the, uh, on the PAG oil side, side. for standard okay. PAG so vehicles. Pretty much the same thing, guys. Yep. Uh, no automatic oil injection is allowed in the U.S. with the 2843 standard. The reason is because we have hybrids now. And they said, you know what, we don't want to let you automatically inject oil because we want to be able to ensure that the machines can't put the wrong oil in the wrong vehicle. Small oil. Okay. And in reality, automatic oil injection is nice, but the problem with it is this car takes, I don't even know what it takes, PAG 46. The next car takes a PAG 100. Excuse me, while you're yakking, yep. I'm going to... Uh, the next one takes a PAG 150. How often is somebody really changing the oil on the automatic oil injection? It doesn't happen. So if you use manual oil injection with some of these twist type things or one of those deals, you can grab the right one, you can inject the right amount, and you're good to go. Um, they're reviewing whether we're going to get new EPA certifications. Uh, it's been proposed. It was proposed under SAEJ 2845 by SAE. It was proposed uh, again by Mobile Air Conditioning Society. The EPA has yet to make a ruling on that, so we don't know what's going to happen. We hope that there's a better uh, or a tighter standard than we have now, because in reality, 609, which is what we have now, was a good right. idea. Is that was the question? Yep, 609. But, you know, my 10-year-old could have passed the test and gotten his card if he had a card. Actually, card. I think that did happen. That did my 10-year-old at yeah, the time. It could have. <laughs> it, it certainly could have. Because you really oh, yeah. know a lot. But Craig? Uh, Craig did that? Uh, 12, yeah. 12. Yeah, 12. Yeah, 12. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Now, in the background, just to interrupt you one second, sure. you heard the purge. I injected the oil, and now the refrigerant is going in just in the sake of time. Okay? So we're charging the system up. This charges from the high side. It tells you don't hit the machine. It's really bulletproof, easy stuff to do. Yep. Never ever start the uh, the air condition or the engine up with refrigerant going in from the high side, or you'll slug the compressor. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't broken before, we'll be broken out. Mm -hmm. And, so, and, and she's going to make sure this one's done right because <laughs> it's not really a customer's car. 
See, there's this deal. There's a there, there's a nice sedan parked out front that G likes to think of as his regular daily driver. And this one might belong to maybe G's better half. And if it's not going to cool quite right, I'm she's going to be driving that quite that's right. that, that, that nice sedan right. out front. You're going to be sweating your ass off. That's right. Excuse, I'm sorry. No, it's a okay. All right. I think they heard the A word before. I, okay. I'm going to pull you all the time anyway. <laughs> My sensitive so anyway. ears. Uh, it's <laughs> unlikely at this point in time that we're going to see sales to the consumer of this product. I say unlikely. You know we've got those 12, 13 ounce cans of 134 AG in, right. and they got all kinds of crap in them. Right now there is no approved can or fitting to put 12 ounces of, or 14 ounces of refrigerant in. But it's not to say that the lobby out there won't get one approved eventually. So right now we don't see it. Um, be careful. This is, this is where independent repair shops and stuff, this is where we need some sort of association or voice yep. to prevent that from happening because once they put this in a little can, Joe Schmo is going to go buy this and then you're going to get companies rather than the real stuff downgrading this to other garbage. It's going to get up into yep. your machine and into other cars. It's going to be a mess. And we all know, at least everyone in the business, realizes that the likelihood of Joe Backyard Mechanic fixing his air conditioning himself is not very high. Well, that's true, but I think most of you guys would agree with me out there. Some of these people will try anything to save money. You know, we have a lot of these big parts places and whatever. Yep. They sell everything. Some even give you printed directions on what to do. Oh, I think so we need, some, we need some standard. We need to, to say some sort of government regulation where they do not allow a small camera. I, I and absolutely agree. We'll look into it because I'll be on it. I'll see you know who we can get in touch with to do something maybe some of the big uh service station associations or repair shop associations this is something they need to get behind right okay. we'll try on our end from tst we're all about technicians we're not shop owners but right. we'll see what we can do to get some information on it yeah. craig can you jump that next uh next slide for us he's sleeping on us one more Okay, let's talk about 134A. I know we're on the 1234YF, but we just want to kind of give you some highlights of what you're going to see in the 1234YF tools by referring to the 134A tools. First of all, um, we, we want to talk about the 2791, J2791 leak detector, which we'll show you a picture of in a moment, as well as the, the primary features of the 2788 recovery recycling machines and, of course, existing the 1771 identifiers. Thanks, Craig. You didn't right. say you didn't say clutch. I said, oh, that's right. I was supposed to say. Is it good? Uh, this is a Tracer Products TP9364. I think there's one here. And, yeah. Uh, um, which is an example. I'm gonna hold it up right for you. Uh, an example of a 2791 leak detector. There's several different leak detectors approved to 2791. This happens to be one of them. Thanks for the warning. This is one of them, 2791 leak detector. Um, all 2791 leak detectors require that they have three settings. One for high sensitivity of one seventh of an ounce per year or four grams or so. One for medium sensitivity of a quarter of an ounce per year or seven grams. And one for a half an ounce per year. The reason they did this was to make sure that if you're working on a vehicle from 1994 that has 134A in it, that was never designed to be very leak tight, and you're using the super sensitivity setting on it that you would use on a 2010 model, that super sensitivity setting will go off forever regardless of what parts you change in that 1994 vehicle. So they gave you something where we said we can find a big leak, we can narrow it down to a small leak and a small leak. And all the 2791 stuff has that same requirement. For the new 2913 for 1234YF has that same, same requirement. A couple other things, same requirement. Okay. Now there's a couple of different ways to find leaks. That's right. one of them. What we do when we're using that leak detector, and when we put it, this one right here. When we're checking the low side, one of the things you like to do with the low side, if you look now, is 30-something pounds, okay? When the 
when the compressor is off, the low side is higher, isn't it? It was equal yep. like before. Right. We like to stay under the line, and we want to see, since the refrigerant is heavier, it drops down and it'll pick it up. This is a better way to utilize this. Right. Another great thing for leaks while we're on it, excuse me, dropping through you, is two different things here. One is an ultrasound leak detector, okay? This ultrasound leak detector, tell you a quick little story. You know, I had put dying a car years back, my daughter had this leak living in Maryland. She came back a couple of times and said, it's still this leak, couldn't find it. I tried everything with the equipment at the time, the leak detector equipment, looked for dye everywhere, couldn't find it. With ultrasound, I was able to hear the leak, okay? When I recovered the refrigerant, the leak was not horrible anymore. I could not hear it. So this is a great tool. And now something that has been very excited, you know, and we've had quite a few PSD members buy this. This is made by UView. I will kind of just shine it back here. First, we'll let Craig see it. Okay. Shine it somewhere else. There you go. Okay. We're shining it, but if Craig can get to the hood of this, you can see that it opens up big. And you can put it down to a narrow type of beam. And the nice thing with this, most black lights, when you hit aluminum, what happens? You start to think you picked up a leak. Yep. This light really zones in on where the leak is. A lot of TSP members bought this, and they really like this light. You should check it out. It's by UView. So Phil and Tony did a great job up there with this light. And make sure really you're using a quality dye. Oh, quality names in the dive name oh, back business. And, and, and you know, I'm going to just run through a couple of couple of the top of my head, ones that you've already kind of looked at here. Tracer makes a quality dive. UV makes a quality dive. There are some brands out there that are diluted. There are some that have certain chemicals in them that are not good for the AC system. So you want to make sure you're looking for not only the quality tools, but using a quality dive. And that's important. I didn't realize this, though. I think I was speaking to Phil Triviati. He was telling me that, you know, sometimes when you buy a light and it comes to dye, yep. and then you go to the bar store and buy a different dye, and you're looking and you can't find a leak. The reason is you're using a dye that he was just talking about that is not the same quality. Okay. So you need to kind of look at purchasing the correct stuff. Right, right. And you know, we're running the car in the background here, so it's making some noise. We got some good reading. And uh, Craig says we're going to die in here because I've got the hose on it. Oh, no, no, no. Craig, we would never do it. Can I plug my stuff? Take it to my shop? What do you think of that? Well, FJC is a quality company. Yeah. What I don't know is if FJC makes their own dye or not. And I know the folks at FJC. So I honestly don't know if they do. But what I do know is some of the companies like the ones we've mentioned, again, not to go through a whole list, like the UV or a Tracer, will brand their dye to the same quality they make it for other companies. And, and that may be one of those I don't know. I've had good luck with them years back when I used it, but yep. again, good stuff like you do, yep. that's, that's the stuff to buy. Especially with that light, it kicks butt. Sure. Do we have questions at this point? We're going to keep going, but not a problem. Yep. Let's talk about the machine here, your RR and R. You're a lot of R's. Yep. Well, they, this, this is referring to the machine that we have, of course, right behind us we've been using, which is the Robinair 34788. Notice the trend, 34788, 2788 standard machine, J2788.134A. 95% recovery in 30 minutes or less. Plus or minus one ounce on recovery. Plus or minus a half an ounce on charge. And make sure, if you're dealing with hybrids, that you have something like the Aircept filters in line before you charge that car Very so cool. that you don't accidentally get the wrong oil there. The 2788 standard and the 2843 standard are very similar to each other. They both have these similar requirements right here. So we'll know that when you get a 2843 machine, these will be some of the basics of what you're going to see in those machines. Okay, you want to hit us up once more? Um, this is a refrigerant identifier, a, a 1771 identifier. We showed it to you earlier. 
capable of doing 12 to 134 a with a digital display, a printer, an optical battery, a couple other things in there. The new standard, J2912, those refrigerant analyzers will look similar to on the USB port on them because they have to tether to the recovery recycling machine, give it a good signal before you're allowed to recover refrigerant. And um, they'll be capable of doing, at a minimum, 134A to 134YF. Some may be available for R12, but in all likelihood, because R12 is going away, the focus will be on uh, 134A and 1234YF uh, for any of the ones that we know that will be coming out. That makes sense. Yeah, like you'll still be able to see if there's some other refrigerant in Absolutely, you're right. One of the things about the U.S. standard compared to the standards in Europe, in the U.S. we're required as a manufacturer of refrigerant analyzers to show you what the percentages are. In Europe, we're not allowed to show the percentages. It's yeah. pass or fail. fail. Amazing. Pass or fail only in Europe. But here we have to show you the percentages of hydrocarbons at 22 and, and 134A and so forth and so on. Excellent. That's okay. a great thing. You can print it out and give it to your customer and all that good stuff. So if we go back and we just look, we're going to stay on this slide. The tools for 1234 wire are going to be 2913 for the leak detector standard, for the electronic leak detector, 2843 for the recovery recycling machine, and 2912 for refrigerant identifiers. And they'll be similar to the latest standards we have for 134A. Some minor differences, but you cannot retrofit that I'm aware of any 2791 leak detector to make it into a 2913 leak detector. Um, we know you can't retrofit a recovery recycling machine to go from one to the other, at least not here in the US. And to my knowledge, there will be no retrofitting of identifiers because at least on Neutronics products, it's kind of different guts inside. Training programs, all that kind of stuff will still exist, but it's different guts inside, so you, you know, it's all better to do that. Now maybe if um, Neutronics may come out maybe with a machine that will do both. Well, we know we're going to have 12, uh, 134A and 1234 YF machines. Um, and then we'll do both. Combination machine, just like we have today. But what we're not likely to be able to do is to update an old machine to be able to do the new refrigerant because it is different. Hardware. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, we have a little, a little deal for our, our TSP members and our, our people watching out there. As, as a lot of you guys know, or most of you guys know, we, we're, we're kind of like Intel. We sell to a lot of different companies and, and we make our products available to shop owners and technicians only really because a lot of them may not have a Snap-on dealer nearby or a NAPO or, or some other outlet that we sell through. So we do make them available, but we also sell paper and filters and so forth, really just as a convenience to you guys. So if you want to, uh, if you need paper, you need filters, anything, little parrot here. Uh, we've got a coupon code that saves you 25% at refrigerantid.net. Coupon code is TST Rocks, And I was going to put G-Rocks. But that was already stated. Um, and I was going to go with Craig Rocks, but it was too many letters. <laughs> so TST Rocks, uh, and through August, if you use that coupon code, again, not here to sell you anything. You don't have to go buy anything. If you need something and you're looking for it, if you can't get it through a local distributor or your mobile tool what dealer or whatever, this is one place where you will find all the parts for uh, Neutronics machines that we make available. And we always thank the electronics for the help. You got some other information here, correct? Uh, future online training opportunities here. August 18th, uh, Euro Battery Relearns with P10. So check that out. That's next Thursday, I believe, already. Uh, the week after, I get to see my buddy Pete Meyer coming up. That's August 25th, another Thursday. Keep EMS service and, uh, and diagnosis. Uh, September 15th, we're back with our normal TSP, we're up in Massachusetts, live seminars, we're also in Connecticut, New Jersey, and then on the 15th, here in New York, BW Data Blocks, we can, a very, very good European class, October 13th, real, real world reprogramming, uh, so if you're into reprogramming cars, or thinking about getting into it, or don't know anything about it, great class, uh, November 10th, uh, we're back on electrical stuff. This is also a good class. You never know enough about electricity. 
And then we got fuel stuff in November. And of course, we'll be here in December, in January, all the way to June. So we want to thank you. Check us out at psbseminars.webex.com. Check our new website out, PSP Seminars, a new face on it. And there's some of the information. We reach people all around the world now. Australia, Asia, over in the Middle East, and of course, throughout our great country of the U.S. And the uh, last plug here, if you're interested in some hands-on training, I do contract work all over the place, ATTS training, and that's where we're from here. And I think if there's questions, Craig, no questions. So we will wrap this up, and I can tell you this in the background before we wrap it up. We have some pretty good pressures. Our temperature is down to 38 in there. 38. 38 degrees inside the car and 106 inside the shop. <laughs> Carbon dioxide levels are rising. That's what well, he's, he's going to fade real soon. But I want to thank you again. My name is Pete Trulia. And for Peter Call, thank you very thank much you. for your Pleasure. Thanks, 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 Pleasure